so glad you tuned in today to listen to Lighthouse Christian Church. Let us join the service currently in progress. Well, we want to jump into our message for this morning, and we are working our way through the Gospel of Matthew, and we are actually now in Matthew chapter 3, going to open to it, and we're picking it up in verse 13, and this message this morning is about the baptism of Jesus. Last week we heard about how John the Baptist came preparing the way for Jesus and he did that by sharing a message of repentance with the people. We're on the wrong track. We've made our mistakes. We've fallen short. We need to change, not just a little bit, but completely and come back to worshiping the Lord, focusing on the Lord, living our lives under the Lord. This was his message of repentance to pay, pave the way for the Savior who was coming and is now here. How wonderful this message of John the Baptist. While it's a message that brings conviction, it also brings the very solution for that conviction and that problem, which is the Messiah himself who has now come into this world. So the message of John the Baptist was a huge and powerful message and so many people responded to the message and he was preparing the people and the country for the arrival of the Messiah who happens to be Jesus the Christ. So now we come to, and so he was baptizing people in the Jordan River as they came to confess their sins and go through this cleansing of being baptized in the Jordan and coming up out of the water feeling clean that their their sins had been clean somehow. There was something really powerful about this, but it started with them repenting of their sins and committing to be on a different course. Now we come to the baptism of Jesus himself, which is so, so fascinating. But let's read our first, our, our first point is, Jesus came to be baptized by John. John did not go to Jesus. Jesus came to John, Scripture tells us. Matthew 3.13, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. This was very important in Christ's life that he would be baptized and he would be baptized by John, the one who had prepared the way for him. Matthew 3.14 Clues us into John's thinking about this, but John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? How does this make sense that I'm preaching a baptism of repentance because we've all fallen short and we need you and now you're coming, the one who does not need to repent to be baptized by me. It didn't make sense to John. It's really fascinating, and I love his response in humility, which is, I can't do this. This don't make no sense. You're the Lord of the universe. You're the one who is to come. You don't need to repent. But in fact, Jesus says to him in Matthew 3, 14, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. When Jesus responds, now John understands he needs to do this. There's a specific and really important purpose for this, and it's to fulfill all righteousness. So that's a big sentence, but what it then allows John to do is to respond in obedience, and then he consents. Even though he feels unworthy because of his own sin, He is going to baptize the Messiah. It's really fascinating to me. I love the fact that Jesus goes to John. The fact that John would come with this in prophetic fulfillment to be the one who would prepare the way for the Messiah means that the Messiah needs to show up. You don't prepare the way for someone and then they go in a different direction. He was preparing the way for the Messiah 
And here is the Messiah. How important it was for the Messiah to come to also affirm John's message of repentance and change and pointing to him. Jesus had to come and Jesus came. And then it says, we need to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus did not need to do this and it made no sense for him to be baptized with the baptism of repentance. He had not sinned in one little place. He had been perfectly obedient to the Father. He did not need a baptism of repentance. So what we understand from Jesus' baptism is his is not a baptism of repentance. While Christ has come to John, because John has prepared the way for him, Jesus has come to John to affirm his message and then to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. This is not a baptism of repentance. It can't be. It's a baptism that shows and sets an example for us, for sure, as it relates to a new life. Jesus has come to bring life, to make all things new. So, of course, in his own baptism, he was bringing something completely new, which was not a baptism of repentance, but it was also, in essence, a precursor in some regard of the fact that his followers would go through a baptism which would not just be of repentance, but of obedience to God, and there would be a change that would come through the Holy Spirit into their lives. So this is extremely significant. The other thing that's significant about it is this is a defining point in the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry where God himself, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are present to affirm and to publicly proclaim who this is as God's beloved Son. So let's read our second point. As soon as he was baptized, what happened? The Spirit of God descended on Jesus. Matthew 3.16 says, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. Were you watching? Was there, was there should have been a picture up there, maybe right before. The, there's a Spirit of the Lord that came right down to Jesus. And it's, it's, you can see the dove there, this whether it's symbolic or whatever, but it happened to be this dove, this presence, which we understand to be also in the Holy Spirit that was descending here right at that moment. This is really, really special. When I was baptized, and I trust when you were baptized, there was no dove. If there was a dove, let me know. I'd really like to interact with you differently in the future. There was no dove that came down in my baptism. But the power of the Holy Spirit was so present in our baptism, and it was rich, and it's beautiful how God, through His Spirit, engages with us. But He did this in a remarkable way because this is a very special, this is a unique baptism of Jesus Christ, God's only Son, and this dove comes down. It's like, wow, this is more than special effects with Hollywood. This is something remarkable that's taking place because this is the beginning of Christ's ministry, and God is right there present with him through his Holy Spirit to do something extremely special to highlight this moment and to show the engagement. So the Holy Spirit was very present. And the thing that's amazing as we study the Holy Spirit, and we've done this in other messages and talked about it at other times, the part of the mission of the Holy Spirit is always to point us to Jesus. Always. If you look in Scripture, it's always pointing people to Jesus Christ. Here the dove is coming to a light, to light on Jesus Christ, pointing to Jesus Christ. This is awesome. It's beautiful. It's powerful.
Matthew 28, verse 19, when Jesus talks about the Great Commission later on, after his death, after his resurrection, as he's giving out the Great Commission to his apostles and his disciples, and that extends down to the generations to us, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is a direct reference to the Trinity. But right here in these verses, we see the direct reference to the Trinity because Christ is present in the baptism. The Holy Spirit is present and descending upon him. And we're going to come to this last and third point in a second, which is God the Father is there to publicly affirm his beloved Son. But Acts 2.38 says, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, which we just talked about, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I put this in here. It was a verse from last week as well, talking about repentance and the connection with the forgiveness of sins. But the real connection is so that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we see the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus, but the Holy Spirit is available to each and every person who repents and calls on the name of the Lord. God comes to offer his forgiveness, and he does that by also imparting within us his Holy Spirit. It's incredible. It's true. You and I are changed forever when Christ has come into our life and His Holy Spirit now resides within us. And His Holy Spirit within us will continue to point us to Jesus all the time through the rest of eternity. And in this life for sure. And He'll guide us and He'll counsel us and He'll do many things to encourage and support us through His Holy Spirit that is present within us. But I love the fact that God has chosen to make it so clear in Jesus' baptism that the Holy Spirit is there descending on him and identifying him and there in that very special moment to fulfill all righteousness. The third point this morning is that God the Father publicly affirms In the baptism, his beloved son. Matthew 3.17 says, And a voice from heaven said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This was a voice from heaven. This was audible. Others could hear it. God the Father is speaking into that situation and speaking to others and saying to them, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. He has not done that with any other person in human history, or in any history, recorded anyway. It hasn't happened. Jesus was the one and only. When people still look to see Jesus as a prophet or something else, they're just completely overlooking, I don't know how many scriptures, but they're overlooking this one for sure. It's Jesus. It's not anyone else. There is nobody else. There is no answer for salvation, for forgiveness of sins, for getting you out of bondage, for giving you eternal life. There's no one. It's Jesus Christ. And here he is getting baptized. And here the Holy Spirit descends on him. And here the Father says from heaven, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Let's make this clear. He's the one. It couldn't be more clear from Scripture that Jesus is the one. And this is even before the miracles. This is even before the death. This is before the resurrection. But God is identifying his own and the one and only Lord and Savior of this world. Matthew 17, 5 says, While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. 
Now, where did this take place? Some of you might recognize this was when Jesus, towards the end of his earthly ministry, went up into the mountain with Peter, James, and John and was completely transfigured and they got to see him in his glory. And he appeared and he was talking with two other individuals who are identified in Scripture as Moses and Elijah who had both lived prior. So Jesus is with Peter, James, and John and he's with Moses and Elijah in this very special moment. And in that, God chooses again to communicate for the sake of Peter, James, and John. This is my son whom I love. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. I love the fact that when he's actually talking to Peter, James, and John, he adds, listen to him. The Lord has to remind me every day to listen to him. Every day. So many times every day, the Lord needs to remind me to listen to him. I have Christ in my life, and so do you. I have the Holy Spirit in my life, and so do you. And I can still be caught up in my way of doing things, my way of thinking, my way of behaving. And God's reminding me through scripture, through worship, through communication with others, through prayer, listen to Jesus. Follow him. Do what he wants you to do. He's your Lord. He's your Savior. Rejoice in him. Appreciate him and grow in that and follow him. No matter what, no matter what, follow him. I was talking with a brother this morning that was sharing part of his journey with me, and it was a more general conversation this time. We've had other conversations talking about the spiritual warfare because a lot of people really don't understand the spiritual warfare that takes place. If you don't know Christ, you don't know the spiritual warfare that takes place when you are in Christ, and it takes place. Satan's still there accusing. Satan's still there trying to do everything to derail us. That's the truth. Others might be too in their confusion because they don't know in life. They're pretending. If they think they know, they're pretending. They don't. If they don't know Jesus, they don't know the truth, the way, or the life. But the truth is, I need to be reminded each and every day, and you do too, about Christ and listen to him, follow him, realize that you're standing with the God of the universe, or he's standing with you, he's protecting you, he's fighting, he's helping you, he's helping you every minute of every day, but listen to him. Pay attention to him, or that might happen again. But it's, it's remarkable how God, again, for the sake of Peter, James, and John, uses these very same words. This is my beloved son. My beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. He was perfect. He did everything perfectly. Listen to him. John chapter 1, verse 14, right at the beginning of the gospel of, of John, which is so remarkable, it talks about, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Now, John can say this. Many people can say this. John can surely say this because he was also present for his life his earthly ministry part of it, for his death, for his resurrection, seeing him after he was resurrected, before he ascended. But he also was there in the Mount of Transfiguration. He was present. He saw Christ in his glory in so many different ways. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the Father, the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So here we have John in his witness, in his testimony, in his gospel, right at the very beginning, talking about the word, Jesus Christ, becoming flesh, living amongst us, and we've seen his glory. We know who he is, and he is the only son of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
But this all relates to the fact that Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are perfectly united. We see this in Scripture so many times, but we see it right here in four verses in His baptism where Christ, to fulfill all righteousness, to continue to act in perfect obedience, goes to John, is baptized, and the Holy Spirit descends, and God the Father speaks and tells those who can listen who His Son is and how He loves Him and how He is well pleased with Him. This is the perfect affirmation. So the baptism of Jesus is so significant to us and to all of history because it was fulfilling God's express purpose in the life of Jesus Christ to be identified early in His earthly ministry and to have the relationship in direct display with the Holy Spirit and with God the Father. So thank you, Lord. Let's, let's pray as we wrap up the message here. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your scripture again that highlights these things. They're remarkable things. They're beautiful things. If we saw them in a movie, we'd say, wow, that's amazing. That's really cool. But it goes beyond that. It goes so far beyond that. The spiritual significance, the depth of this, where you gave Christ a purpose and a mission, and he came voluntarily and in perfect obedience and to fulfill all righteousness. He did everything you asked him to do, Lord. And because of that, he is now our Lord and Savior. He's the one who had the power to forgive sins. And he surely did it by sacrificing himself. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that always points to Jesus, that always helps us to see Jesus and helped us to come to Jesus and this understanding of Jesus as our Savior and Lord in the very moment of our conversion. Thank you ever since that point that you've continued through your Holy Spirit to point to Jesus and remind us to listen and follow Jesus. Thank you, Father, that you would send your Son in this unbelievable plan of salvation and redemption for humanity, and that includes us and so many others. Continue this great work, Lord, but thank you for identifying your son for us in life, in scripture, and for giving him to us as our greatest gift because of the life that he's given to us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this assembly. We thank you for all of our loved ones who are standing in Christ and with Christ. We thank you, Lord, and we ask for blessings over those who have not come to this saving grace and knowledge of who Christ really is. We pray for them. We want them to know you and experience the fullness of life eternally in Jesus Christ as we do. And we thank you. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.